and uh, I was really raring to get up and uh, do a rip snorter, brother, I'm telling you, but, but I think that it's more needful uh, that I do what I believe God would have me to do tonight. And so I'm going to try and follow the leadership of the Holy Ghost, and, and uh, I hope that it's a blessing to you. Father, now in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, that you'd anoint me. Father, uh, give, give me the words that I need to speak this evening to be an encouragement to thy people. Lord God, there are people here who are hurting. We've got folks in our midst that have financial troubles, health problems. Lord, there are people filled with doubt. Now, God, I pray that this night, that those that came here hungering and thirsting, Lord, would receive the promise of Jesus that they shall be filled. Lord, I yield myself to you, and I ask now that you'd use me for thy glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 1. When uh, Brother Rick Owens preached Sunday night, he was talking about how he thought, well, they, they, got, they were getting all around my message and I was worried they were going to head preach it for me. Well, he hit on mine. <laughs> and I was afraid he was going to go ahead and uh, preach it for me. But fortunately, the Lord held him back. The Word of God says in Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy. <laughs> as Brother Ballou would say, I think I just had a gob of honey drop through my soul. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, and by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his mercy uh, kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk therein. Everything in the Christian life is a matter of God's grace. There is not one deed that you can perform that's acceptable in His sight that's not performed through you instead of by you. There is not one step that you can take, one word that you can utter that'll have any value in eternity that's not a product of the Spirit of God working within our hearts. And in order for that to be the case with us, we got to realize that in every situation of our lives that what we are hinges on those two words, but God, but God. That's how your Christian life begins. I don't know what you remember about your old life. Some say that uh, the, the years cause the memories to fade, and sometimes we have a, a habit of uh, kind of glossing over some of the bad things about ourselves when we look back. But I can assure you that no matter how wicked you were 
or what a nice person you were who just needed a little help from the Lord, you were all equally dead in sins and trespasses. For you see, there are no degrees of death. No degrees of death. I think about Jairus' daughter laying there. She was a 12-year-old girl. While they walked in, she just passed on. I bet the blush was still in her cheek. Her eyes still had a shine to them. And then you think of the widow and Ain's son. Well, they were carrying him down to the tomb. I mean, he was dead and cold, brother. And then you think of Lazarus. He laying in the tomb for three days, and his sister said, By now he stinketh. And though they had not all reached the same degree of corruption, they were all equally dead. There are no degrees of death. I, I heard a testimony a while back, and I took the time today to go online and to watch it again. I love to see the testimony of people that God has brought out of, out of sin and turned into saints of God and marvelously changed and transformed them through the power of the gospel. And <laughs> I'd like to share this man's testimony with you, if I may. His name is John Blaye. Now, John, he lives in Liberia. His father was a member of a tribe in Liberia, and uh, through a set of circumstances, he managed to go away from the tribe and leave the country and, and attend school and became an educated man, a businessman. He had people that worked with him, worked for him, owned properties, had a building and an office. But you see, something that he wasn't able to, to leave behind was the legacy of his family. There came a time when his uncle, who was the witch doctor in that tribe, died. And as John Blaye put it in his testimony, what he called the mantle that his uncle wore fell upon his father. Well, his father's unaware of what's going on. Of course, they were all raised in the midst of demons and worshiping false gods and, and practicing all manner of ungodliness. But he said that his father had told him that he found that he was able to read people's minds. The men that he worked with come in his office and they'd catch him when he was possessed by spirits. They said he could literally climb the walls. And one day they locked him in that office and they finally convinced him he needed to return to the tribe to find out what the problem was. Well, he goes back to the tribe and finds out that uh, his uncle had died and apparently the spirit that was in his uncle had entered him. And so they asked him about taking on the job, and he explained his situation, and they couldn't allow him to do it because of their tradition. They said, because of your position in life and your education, the people won't respect you like they should. We need your firstborn son to come and take your place. Well, he was married, and... He went back to the city and brought his wife and his son down to present him to them. And they found out that his son was uh, born of a woman who wasn't a member of their tribe, and they rejected him. And they said, our tradition demands that it be somebody who is of the clan. The mother has to be from the clan and the father. So what you need to do is pick a woman out of the tribe here and produce a son through her. And he said, but I'm already married. They said, that doesn't matter to us. That's not our problem. He said, I'll tell you what, I don't want to mess it up, so you pick the woman. So they go and they picked a woman who's already married, and they set it up where they had relations, and that's where John Blahey came from, from that relationship. He was born when he was seven years old. His father brought him back to the village. 
and he was brought in and they t get a three day ritual with him. And that was the first time that he ever drank blood. He said as he came up on a monthly basis, they practiced human sacrifices. Every month, someone had to die. He was a great man among his people, one with great power. And he was filled with the devil. He said he had personal audiences with the demon that possessed him, that they, they would talk to him face to face. Well, civil war broke out in Liberia. And when the war broke out, of course, he began to gather the young men in his tribe around him and to go out and to fight. He became famous for this. He would go into villages and they would kidnap young men and take them away and they would tell them, you can fight with us or die and force them to fight. And the thing that set him apart from every other general in Liberia was this. Because he was a shaman, a witch doctor, he believed that he had extraordinary powers when he was naked. And so he and all of his men, when they fought, all they wore was a scarf around their neck and the shoes on their feet. They believed it made them invulnerable to bullets. And if you could imagine three or 400 naked men charging at you drug crazed, drunk and crazy, firing AK-47s and wielding machetes, they were quite an awesome, fearsome sight. During his career, he was called General Butt Naked. That's what he was known as. I know it's funny. I know it's funny, but that's what they call him at. General Butt Naked, because that's the way he and his men fought. Well, he was involved in the Civil War throughout the, the course of it, and up as it was starting to wind down, he told this story. He said that, that one day he was sitting in the territory in the city that he controlled, and he was like a king. He's sitting there, and they're preparing to go out to battle, and he instructed them to bring me, bring me a child. Because before every battle, they had a practice that they did since he was a witch doctor. They would offer up a human sacrifice. And he said that they brought the child to him, and he took his knife and stabbed it and killed it and cut its back open and separated the ribs, took the heart out, diced it up, and passed the pieces around to his friends. They caught the blood in a basin and they drank the blood. This was to give them power when they fought. We're talking about a man who is crawling with demons. We're talking about a man who was responsible for the death of 20,000 people. He killed hundreds himself. He was in the grip of Satan and no man could free him. But he said on that particular day, after he had passed out the blood and the heart and his people had all gone to cleanse themselves and prepare for the battle, that while he was sitting there in his chair that he ruled from, he heard a voice behind him calling his name, saying, John, John. And he said, I said, what? And he said, John, you're a king, but you live like a slave. And he said, I'm not a slave to any man. He said, oh, you're a slave, all right. And he said he turned around and, the, and he saw a vision of a man shining behind him. And that man told him, I'm going to tell you something. You can go on the way you are and perish, or you can repent and come to me and live. And he said, ah, man. and goes to battle. He said he got in battle and his gun jammed up. He said for the first time in his life he was afraid. And the image of that figure that he saw stayed with him. And, to make a long story short, John Blaye got saved. A man who was a witch doctor, who practiced human sacrifices, who was a cannibal, 
was born again by the grace of God. Amen. And now every time I think about John Blahey, instead of thinking but naked, I think but God. Amen. And brother, sister, that's your story. That's your story. Oh, maybe you weren't, thank God none of us were doing the things that he did. But I, that does not matter. Because it said in the Bible that he is guilty of, that, that transgresses in one area is guilty of everything. It said there's none righteous, no not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it's nothing but the grace of God that makes us what we are today. No accomplishment, no ability, no, uh, no, no amount of wealth that we possess, not our intelligence. None of those things amount to a hill of beans in the eyes of God. It's only what He works in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what God is looking for in my life and in yours. Every one of us, every one of us were just as guilty before God as John Blahey was. Every one of us were. We were just as dead in sin and trespasses as the most vile, despicable sinner that's ever walked the face of this earth. But God, but God, that's how the Christian life starts. For every person, every, you're walking along, you got your plans, you love your sin, but God yeah. has another plan. And not only does it begin that way, that's the way that the, the life of a saint progresses. Throughout their life, you come up on situations that seem insurmountable, problems that you can't figure out, uh, 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 needs that are beyond your ability to supply. And in every situation, you'll find that it's but God who comes through. I remember in Genesis chapter 15, when it talks about uh, Joseph after his father had died. And his servants went to Joseph and they said, listen, the last thing that your dad wanted before uh, he died, he wanted us to tell you to please forgive your brothers for selling you into slavery. Please don't. Don't, don't be harsh with them. Don't hurt them. And Joseph said, uh, <laughs> it says here, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God... But God meant it unto good to bring to pass that it is this day to save much people alive. We're talking about a man when he was a little boy, when he was weak, when he didn't have the strength to resist. He was sold into slavery. And now he's a grown man. He's the head of Pharaoh's household. He's the second ruler in the Egyptian empire. Let that sink in. Going from the pit to the palace. Amen. Amen. Why? Because of a but God. Amen. That's why. Amen. His brothers did it out of jealousy. They did it out of spite. But God turned it around and Amen. used it for his glory and to preserve his people's lives. Amen. I think of Samson in Judges 15. Samson had gone, and, and look at the contrast here. We've got a, a little child, just a, a young lad, and now we've got Samson, hmm, big and strong. Samson had gone in Judges 15. He'd gone to see his, uh, the, the wife that he had, and, and he goes to his father-in-law with a gift, hoping that he might have a little uh, private time with his woman. His father-in-law said, I'm sorry, son, but uh, while you were gone, I thought you were over her. So I gave her to your friend, and now she's married to him. Well, Samson got tore up. He went out and caught 300 foxes, and he tied their tails together, two by two, 
and put a firebrand between them and turned them loose in the cornfields of the Philistines. Well, you know what that meant. He burned up their crops. The Philistines were, who did this? Who did this? They were outraged. They found out. They said, well, it, it was, uh, I think his name was Jephthah. It was, it was his son-in-law because he gave his daughter to marry uh, his friend. So they go to, to the man and, and to the woman, and they took them, and they killed them, and they burned them with fire. Then they go up to, to uh, Judah looking for Samson, and all of his people see him coming, and they say, man, what have you done to us? Don't you know that the Philistines rule over us? And now you brought them down on our head. And he said, I tell you what, you promise me you won't kill me and you can surrender me to them. And they said, we promise we won't harm you. And he let them bind him. They tied him up, took him down. When he got down there and they handed him over to the Philistines, it said that the, the bonds that had him bound, they burst like they were on fire. They just came off of him. He picked up the jawbone of an ass and killed a thousand Philistines by himself. After he'd done all this, what happened here? Judges 15, chapter number, uh, or verse number 18, it says, After he had done that, in the place called Ramoth Lehi, he was sore athirst and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. But God clave a hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, he revived, wherefore he called the name there in Kikori, which... Uh, is in Lehi unto this day. But God, man, I mean, there he was. He had killed a thousand men and was going to die over a glass of water. That's how frail we are. That's how weak we really are. But God saved him alive. In your life, there had been time after time after time when things have come up against you. I can tell you my story. I, I sat in a wheelchair and was told I would never walk again, but God. And then the, the, the medication that, that they put me on got a hold of me. And at first it gave me pleasure and then it turned to pain. And it was destroying my life. I lost everything I had but God. And when I look at myself and know if I was waiting to balance on my own, I'd be in hell my back broke. All I can say is but God. And the same is true of you. And I just want to encourage you tonight. No matter what your situation is, look back at the time after time after time in your Christian life that God has brought deliverance to you. And tell yourself over and over and over again, I was about to fall, but God. I had stumbled, but God. My home was breaking up, but God. And look at the situation that's facing you right now and know that it can't be over. It, it's not going to be over because one day you'll look back and say, but God brought me through this too. He's going to bring us through. He's going to bring us through. I, I just, I feel so inadequate to the task, but God, you know, I mean, some of you are sitting here, you're in doubt. You got loved ones who you've given up on. You just gave up on them, man. 
But let me tell you something. Don't give up. Amen. 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 Don't give up. Some of you despair over your health, the health of loved ones. Don't give up. He is faithful. God is faithful. He's faithful. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I, I know that uh, you're able to help, Lord. God, I, I hope I was just able to say something to encourage someone to, in, to, to look towards Thee. Father, we need You. Oh, God, how we need You. Lord, we need Your power in this house. We need our sick healed. We need our, our fractured homes put back together. We need to be encouraged. We need to be revived. We need to see souls saved, Lord. We need you. We need you, Father. God, I pray that you'll do a work in our hearts, Lord, in our lives. And you'll set this church on fire for you. Oh, God. I... I, I I, I, I don't know how to express it, Lord. So I ask you to drive it home to the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name, amen.